Ingrid is our next guest speaker. Ingrid was a 2016 Human Rights Medal finalist and is an active workplace mental health and suicide prevention advocate and educator of more than 16 years. I actually met Ingrid myself um, when we completed our masters in suicidology, so we were we were study buddies. Um, Ingrid is also a founding and managing director of the Mental Health at Work, a consultancy aimed at improving workplace understanding of mental health, resilience and creating sp supportive cultures. <coughs> she contributes to the mental health policy reform in Australia, participating as a member of many national mental health and suicide prevention boards, committees, government advisory, university and research groups. Ingrid, when she finds the time, travels the country and internationally speaking and chairing many conferences and workshops. Having appeared widely in Australian media and radio, Ingrid shares her journey of loving, living and working with many people in her family and workplaces who have been touched directly and indirectly by mental health and suicide. I'd like you to welcome Ingrid, please. Hello. Thank you so much for coming into this session. What an amazing audience. I first of all like to acknowledge um, the custodians of the land on which we stand on, their elders past and present, and to those other peoples who are um, of Indigenous groups who might be present here today. And the second acknowledgement I'd like to make is to those of us who have been touched directly or indirectly, whether we've worked, loved or lived with someone that we've lost in some way to uh, suicide um, or have been bereaved by suicide, have been touched through suicidal behaviours in our lives. When my daughter was little, um, let that go there, when my daughter was young and little, we used to love cuddling up in bed, reading stories. And no wonder years later, we're both still bookworms. But I think back to why that sort of arose. And well, in my family, we all loved reading. And that was something that was passed down to us from generation to generation. And so we've gotten totally into the whole Shrek, the whole Harry Potter thing, the whole, you know, Pinocchio, fairy tales. And I started thinking, what is it about these stories that we commonly share with our children and our children's children. And I started thinking about, well, yes, sometimes it's nice to get lost in fantasy, but they've all got common threads. There's that sense of adventure, doing some high cap things that perhaps you and I might not do in real life and getting away with it. And then there's also pain. And I started thinking, I wonder if this is a nice way, kind way, of preparing our children that at times life is painful, that at times life does bring about difficult challenges. And that at the end of the day, this is actually what it means to be human. That for us to be human, we will all experience some form of loss, love, grief, joy, injury, illness, we're not going to escape a lot of those things in our journeys. And I can certainly attest to that having lived, loved and worked with too many people touched by mental illness and suicide. My late mother had bipolar disorder and spent most of my childhood in and out of psychiatric hospitals receiving ECT treatment. And somehow I, it's only now since her passing 20 years ago that I look back and think how the hell did she hold down a senior executive's role in the 70s, particularly as a woman and in a Japanese company of all places. My own journey started when I was young. I first started thinking about suicide when I was about seven years of age. And it became an obsession for me for many years. How could I get out of what I knew in my heart was a dysfunctional way of living and of being? I'm, I suspect, looking back logically, yes, I was loved. Yes, I was cared for, but not in the sense that I understood it. I didn't get those messages. I thought I was a burden. I felt unloved. I felt uncared for and insignificant. But somehow, I got through those early years, and yes, I tried to take my life on several occasions in my late teens. Somehow I felt braver at the ages of eight and nine than I did at 18 and 19 when it all came crashing down on me. 
I suspect it was the angel that came into my life, the man that I'm still married to 33 years later, who put a ring around my finger and then said, let's give it a go. Everyone said this won't last. Well, 33 years later. It was during that time that when he put that ring on my finger, dragged me out to get some care because he said, I can't help you, Ingrid. I can't live like this. I don't know how to give you inner love or to love yourself and to care for yourself. So I did, I started the journey of psychotherapy. And it was during that time that we had to face a great deal of um, things that were difficult from my past and some traumatic events that had lingered and stayed and still stay there today. But I'd like to think I'm a bit better placed to be able to manage those through some of my mental health support. So it was only in those early days, maybe about four years into our marriage, that hubby and I were driving back from dinner one night. And he pulled over the side, because he was driving, and he gave me a kiss. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a romantic night. And then I looked at him, and he had tears streaming down his face. And I asked him, what's wrong? And he said, you know what it means to me to see you happy within yourself? Do you know, for the last four years, I've come home every night so scared that I'm going to find you dead. I should have known better. I'd done the same thing for my mother when I was little. And sadly, today I stand here and tell you our suicide watch has never stopped because our young teenager has spent the last six years in and out of psych hospitals. And at times we can't get her the help that she's needed. So we've relied on what's worked for me, and that is peer support. So we've done our nine weeks of suicide watch and going up to the stairs every morning and thinking, what will we find? And even to this day, when I call up, because we live in a two-storey house, and when my young daughter is upstairs and I wake her up or say, Amby, time to wake up, by the fourth time she hasn't answered, my throat constricts. If I don't hear anything, I think, do I venture upstairs or do I not? And then I hear, hi, Mum. I can breathe. We've survived another day, one day at a time. It was 20 years ago that my late mother passed away. Well, that's why she's late. She passed away 22 years ago. And it was about a month afterwards that our, my mother-in-law passed away. And over a six-month period, we lost a whole series of our family members. And yet again, I hit the brick and I wanted to die. I was so in this whirlwind of death. I felt trapped. I felt like I couldn't get out of there. The psych ache that I felt was indescribable. I still can't describe it. This, this sense of disconnect, this sense of hopelessness, this sense of worthlessness and insignificance, it's, it is soul destroying. And it got me into a space where, yes, I wanted to die and I have tried to die. I was working for a small organisation at the time and I was taking some leave to try to work through these challenges. And I couldn't. And you know how you get that week's uh, carer's leave, sympathy, compassionate leave? Well, I went back to work and I was not able to function. I tried to put the mask back on, but on this, these occasions, there were times when the mask did not work. But no one knew what to do, no one knew what to say, or so I thought. Well, I had been given the task to look after pay. Generally, numbers run a mile when they see me. And I don't blame them because we just don't get along. So how I even managed to be looking after payroll and not in a great space was really a worry. So at that point, you can imagine I sort of botched 250 pays. Not really endearing myself to the uh, people that we were paying. So there was a mistake, big mistake, a motive mistake. You don't botch up people's pays. I um, tried to fix it with my uh, director, and as it turned out, I thought, okay, we somehow were able to fix something pretty disastrous quite quickly. I then went home 
and rang back the next morning and said to my, my director, I'd actually like to resign. I want to make this easy for you. I am not functioning. I'm not coping. I don't want to get out of bed. I just don't want to leave the house. And his reaction was, that's okay, but come and have a cup of coffee with me. And I'm saying, Richie, I don't want to come in for a cup of coffee with you. Don't make it so hard. I want to make it easy. Just accept my resignation. Let's be done with it. No. If you don't come out for a cup of coffee with me, I'm going to come and see you. I'm thinking, damn, I've got to get out of those flannel pyjamas. So it was like, okay, I can't win. So I went out and thought I'd humour him and have that cup of coffee. And he invited me for another one the next day. And the next day. And I'm thinking, Richard, why are you doing this to me? I'm getting angry. Why? And he said, I care. I actually care about you. Now, he then got the other staff members, it was only a small organisation, to invite me out too. And I was fighting it every step of the way because I really wasn't in a good space. As it turned out, every time I went back in, they'd give me little tasks to do as they were chatting to me over the hour, the two hours. And before I knew it, I'd last a day. And I'd last a longer day. Now, I probably wouldn't recommend this same sort of approach totally today because it could be viewed as harassment, but there is a lesson here. And the lesson is the gift that they gave me was I was back to work on a return to work program and I am absolutely certain that's why I'm alive and doing what I do today because the gift that they gave me is and was priceless and it's a gift that I call a gift that keeps giving because that's why I set up mental health at work. It was because I wanted to give them the gift that I needed, that I had never received before I'd started working there and before I'd met my husband. And I knew that at those times of feeling in those bad places, I wanted compassion. I wanted kindness. I wanted a hug. I wanted to be told it's going to be okay. Instead of what I did here, was Ingrid, you're selfish, you're a coward, you're attention seeking, which was really not helpful at all. And I recall one of my family members on one of my attempts saying, Ingrid, next time you try and take your life, at least do it properly. I'm so glad I didn't listen. But I also know they were in pain. My family did not know what to do. They were terrified in their own way. And it wasn't that I was trying to hurt them. I actually thought I was doing them a favour. I felt that I was a burden. I wanted to try to get out of that particular situation because I felt trapped like this bird dying in a cage. So it was through all those life experiences that I became a mental health advocate mm -hmm. and was involved in a whole range of different areas of the sector. And then when it became apparent that our daughter was following in this difficult path, I knew I really had to stand up and face my enemy once and for all. And so when I was particularly feeling um, quite hyper aroused, because I have bipolar disorder, and when I'm not coping, I either go really up high or really quite down very low. And when I was quite um, hyper anxious, I decided to enrol into two degrees at the same time. Um, yeah, really smart. Don't know how I managed it in amongst the work the workload and so when you read the uh, when you read my CV I don't know how I did it either I think oh god that's too much and it was too much but what did it give me give me a chance to develop relationships with a few really important people that have helped me to stand up here today doing my masters in suicidology was for a very selfish reason I wanted to learn more about what I live with what my daughter lives with what her generation live with what we all live with, because it does touch us in so many different ways, whether we know it or whether we don't know it. It is going to come knocking on our door. And I wanted to know, how the hell do I deal with some of this? And it was by doing this that I started to understand what I could bring back to the clients I work with. And when I started Mental Health at Work 16 years ago, people laughed. People said to me, who's going to come and talk to you about mental illness and suicide prevention? 16 years later, look at us here today. 
I see myself as a messenger, a very simple messenger. And that's why I feel so moved that we are developing this momentum. I remember 16 years ago, we'd be lucky if we filled one of these tables for these sorts of conferences. And I can happily and proudly say how awesome it is to see so many of you coming more and more to these events every year as we do them. Because workplaces are places where we spend a great deal of time, where we have extended family because our family units are changing, and we're in a perfect space to help recognise signs and symptoms so that we can jump in there and show compassion and show kindness so that we can all help each other to blossom and to contribute to life. One last story I would like to share was some 12 years ago, I was watching Andrew Denton's Wild at Heart, um, Andrew Denton's Enough Rope, and he was doing a special program on um, angels and demons about a group of people who were attending one of our sector conferences in Melbourne called THEMS, which is about the peer support, lived experience. Um, now it's a huge conference each year that brings about the entire sector together. Now, in that program, I saw two people that really stuck out to me. There was a gentleman by the name of Phil Hoisenroder. He is actually the uh, manager of the Bipolar Bears. Yes, the, our band down in Melbourne is called Bipolar Bears and they're great. And then there was Heidi Everett, who is one of our gifted angels in the sector who manages life with schizophrenia. But when she's unwell, she draws the most amazing pictures. And when she's well, she sings like an angel. Now, there was one particular day that she was sharing on that program that she was having a psychotic episode outside of Melbourne's main train station. And she was sitting on the uh, gutter and crying. She wanted someone to hug her. It's all she wanted. I was watching that program, crying, thinking, I'm going to find this lady and I'm going to hug her. I never imagined that 14 years later, I would actually be the one receiving her hugs mm -hmm. and giving her hugs to my daughter and that Amber now is part of their organisation called Wild at Heart, which is a music network for people with mental illness and disability, and we know it saves lives, that connectedness, that peer support, and I can honestly say my proudest moments are when I go and watch and sit into some of those music groups, the joy on people's faces. Some people can't sing a note. Some people can't play an instrument, but it doesn't matter. The joy of connectedness, of trying to create music is so magical and powerful. And that is my message, and I hope to be, continue to be that messenger, is to say it's okay not to be okay. It's okay for us to actually work together as workplaces and community to actually do a few acts of compassion and <coughs> kindness, to reach out and give someone a hug. It can be that simple, and yet it can be that critical to keep someone safe. Thank you. Thank you.